creation is humanity's ancient and perpetual fascination. When did it happen and what caused it all? We may finally be getting some answers. Cosmology is the study of the origins and outcomes of the universe. And recently, there have been radical, revolutionary discoveries in the field. The well-accepted theory has been called the Big Bang, an infinitesimally small point, expanded majestically, and cooked up space, time, energy, and matter in a colossal cosmic stew. But research now suggests that the Big Bang may have even been bigger than that. Next, on Closer to Truth, when and how did this universe begin? Welcome to Closer to Truth, I'm Robert Kuhn. Who cares whether the universe is 12, 15, or 20 billion years old? Cosmologists do. Because what happened so very long ago may in fact carry great meaning for us today. We invited some folks who really care about the age of the universe to learn why these world-renowned experts think so hard about when and how it all began. Dr. Wendy Friedman is the principal investigator for a Hubble Space Telescope project determining the expansion and age of the universe. Dr. Andre Linde, professor of physics at Stanford University, developed an inflation theory of the universe. Dr. Leon Letterman is a Nobel laureate in physics and author of From Quarks to the Cosmos. Dr. Frank Tipler is professor of mathematics at Tulane University and co-author of the Anthropic Principle, about the special nature of our universe. And Dr. Nancy Murphy, a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, studies the relationship between science and religion. Wendy, let's start with a basic question, the age of the universe. You are one of the principal investigators measuring distances to galaxies to, as a, a way of understanding how the universe expands and your work with the Hubble Space uh, Telescope. Uh, give us a number. How old is the universe? And why does the expansion rate of the universe help us get that? Well, let me start with the number. We're finding an age of the universe of about 12 billion years old. Mm -hmm. Why that tells you anything about the expansion, you can think of it very much as playing a movie in reverse. That is, if our universe is expanding now, uh, we know that it's expanding. We observe it to be expanding then we know that at some time in the past, galaxies must have been closer together. And we can take that back to the very origin of the universe and see how long the universe has been expanding. And what are some of the methods that you use to observe that expansion now? What we've been doing is to use the Hubble Space Telescope mm -hmm. up above the Earth's atmosphere to measure the distances to galaxies. And this is the first time we've been able to do that outside of the Earth's atmosphere and do those measurements very precisely for a large number of galaxies. And recently, uh, you've gotten the age very, uh, very tight. It used to That's be right. more and uncertain, right? It used to be more uncertain, and, and the approach we took... What was the range took, before, for example? The, the range before was something like 10 to 20 billion years. Mm -hmm. And the approach we took was, we know it's difficult to measure distances. We can't go and take a yardstick to measure distances. We right. have to come sure. up with approaches that sure. allow us to use light from galaxies. Right. So we did the measurement five different ways. And that's how we've convinced ourselves that we understand what the uncertainties are. Great. Andre, uh, inflation has been called one of the most remarkable scientific theories, in, literally in the history of science, uh, seemingly putting reality beyond uh, normal uh, comprehension. Uh, this is going to be a tough question. I want you to give me a short description of inflationary mm -hmm. cosmology and pretend I'm a high school student. Oh, well, this is a tough one. <laughs> Uh, let me start say, with saying that uh, according to the standard Big Bang theory, right. the universe originally began as a fireball, expanding fireball. Just like an explosion. Like. Yeah, yeah, right. like a very, very big explosion. Right. And then we have found that this big explosion is not as big as we need to explain everything right. which we see in the universe. Right. And instead of thinking about the beginning as the universe being very, very hot, we imagining it right now from the very beginning filled with a different type of matter 
which did not contain any uh, elementary particles, which contained something which is called scalar field. And it will put me into trouble trying to explain <laughs> detail of it right now. But it is something like, which looks like heavy vacuum state. A vacuum empty, state. Yeah, empty uh, something which, without any particles, still containing some specific matter, which, well, you do not really see because there is no particles there. Still, it has a lot of energy. But there's so nothing the, there, but there's sort of a potential energy? Uh, yeah, this is a potential energy of this uh, scalar okay. field. Okay. And then this small box filled with a scalar field start expanding exponentially. The universe at this stage expands much faster than in the standard Big Bang theory. And eventually, the scalar field decays. It produces normal elementary particles. Mm -hmm. These elementary particles interact with each other. The universe becomes hot after that. And after that, it becomes described by normal Big Bang theory. Leon, you're an award-winning researcher in high energy physics, a discoverer of uh, some of the elementary particles that form the standard model of how we think about the universe. Uh, why is the question of the origin of the universe an important question for non-scientists to understand? Well, for, for one thing, the age of anything is very sensitive to myself personally. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I think it's important because I think fundamentally almost all human beings who think at all think about origins. Mm -hmm. Where did I come from? Right. You know, you know, was I really you know, brought down by the stork from the... <laughs> It's like that. And yeah. People are interested in their origins and the origins of the world in which we live. It's, nat it's a natural mm -hmm. in many ways. Great. Well, it's, it's certainly an extremely exciting thing for all of us. Uh, Frank, I want to start with only modest controversy. So describe to me <laughs> what the anthropic principle is. The anthropic principle, Robert, says that we have many different types of universes. Um, let's take Andre's um, um, internal inflating universes. Some of them will inflate very rapidly, some of them not very much, and recollapse before you have a time for any intelligent life to evolve in them. So what you have is, so to speak, a selection amongst all these possible universes by the very fact you have life in them. Only those universes that will admit life, only those universes which have just the right collection of physical constants and cosmic stews, to allow life to evolve, to ask the question, how old is the universe, only those universes will be studied. Nancy, is modern cosmology compatible with traditional Judeo-Christian uh, views? That's a difficult question to answer because it keeps changing so quickly. Which one? The, uh, the question <laughs> about the compatibility. <laughs> okay. The um, uh, cosmological theories themselves change very quickly. And a number of, of my friends in theology and science complain that theological books get published so slowly. By the time they get through a theological press, often the science has changed on you. <laughs> but um, uh, there are um, quite a lot of interesting points, not uh, specifically of agreement, but uh, points of contact that make for interesting dialogues between... What are the points of contact between uh, theology and cosmology? Well, uh, one of the questions has to do with the infinity of the universe. One of the um, uh, traditional claims that Christians have made about the universe is that it has somehow got to be less than God. And so they've spoken about that in terms of it being not infinite in time, uh, finite in size, or at least contingent. And it sounds to me that if some of these theories about the universe of universes are true, then we may be looking at an ensemble of universes that is uh, infinite in time, uh, potentially infinite in space, and perhaps necessarily existing. And that's beginning to tread on the theologians' toes a little uh, bit. Are you, so, do you feel uncomfortable with that? Uh, if the universe turns out to, to be described that way, Christian theologians are going to have to do some more homework to ask uh, in what sense they can maintain those traditional claims about the contingency of the universe. Good, that'll give